Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Business Courier. The case for legalizing pot in Ohio, how some Cincinnatians are playing a key role. A former UC Bearcat is focused on helping people make money while doing good for the world. And a church built in 1867 is coming back to life in OTR as an event center. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Good morning and welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Peg Rasconi. On the Business Career front page centerpiece this week, the architect of a proposal to legalize pot in Ohio says, like it or not, it's coming. And you can bury your head in the sand or, and ignore it or be part of the solution. That architect, Ian James, is the CEO of a Columbus political consulting firm. And he is embarking on a joint venture with some powerful Cincinnatians on a $20 million campaign to legalize marijuana this year in Ohio. If the campaign to legalize pot is successful, the economic impact here would be staggering. James has turned to Cincinnati lawyer Chris Stock to draft a proposed amendment to the Ohio Constitution that would outline, outline rather how pot would be regulated for personal and medical use. Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine must determine whether the ballot summary is fair. Then, more than 305,000 registered voters would have to sign petitions by July 1st to get the measure on the November 3rd ballot. The amendment would regulate marijuana, much like alcohol. Legalizing pot could result in a $4.1 billion Ohio industry by 2020 and create 10,000 jobs. Key local players in the effort include James Gould of a Cincinnati private equity firm, his sister Barbara Gould, Cincinnati lawyer Paul DeMarco, Frank Wood of WEBN fame, and former basketball star Oscar Robertson, to name a few. Business Courier reporter Barrett Brunsman wrote this story and joins Business Courier editor Rob Dawmeyer in the studio with more on what he found. Barrett and Rob. Peg, thanks very much. Barrett, thanks for being here. As Peg just mentioned, she ticked off the name. Some, some pretty big power players in Cincinnati are behind this. Uh, a lot of money. What are they going to do with this money that they have to spend? Rob, the Cincinnatians are part of a group of investors, 10 different investment groups from throughout the state. They each ponied up $2 million. That's wow. where the $20 million fund comes from. They're going to use that for advertising, uh, radio, TV, direct mail, and as well as for polling and so forth to, to get the word out and try to get this measure approved on the November ballot. So um, what's the return on investment? I mean, this is a lot of money to put up uh, for any venture, especially your own money. Uh, banks aren't getting involved in this. Um, what's, what is the return on investment? Well, not only are they putting up $2 million each group, but in return, they'll get a marijuana farm. There'll be only 10 farms around the state. And that those farms, it's estimated, might cost 30 to $40 million a piece. Uh, in return for that, Rob, uh, this group behind it, Responsible Ohio, a political action committee, estimates uh, that over a billion dollars annually will go back to these mar marijuana farmers. That is, a, that is a good profit, wouldn't you say? Um, so what is the chance that this is actually going to happen? I mean, there are, f what, how many states? Five, I think, uh, plus the district? The four states plus the District of Columbia already allow marijuana for recreational use. This would do that, plus uh, allow for medical marijuana usage. Uh, there are uh, numerous more states that allow for that purpose. Uh, in Ohio, Responsible Ohio says it's already done polling that indicates 57% of Ohio voters would approve of pot being legal for recreational purposes. Now, there's been some concern about why would you limit this to just 10 groups that could own the marijuana farms, but Responsible Ohio points out uh, there actually be 1,100 retail stores that could sell marijuana throughout the state. They could sell only products produced from, by these marijuana farms, but anybody could apply for a license for one of these retail outlets, Rob. You and I could do this on the weekend if we wanted to. Yes, we could. Uh, and, and as a last note, though, uh, it is illegal federally, which throws the whole, this whole thing into a, a giant question mark, I think. One of the things the investors were warned about, in, in addition to losing tens of millions of dollars if they can't compete, because these 10 farms will compete with each other if this gets approved, uh, they also could go to prison if the federal government decided to crack down on these folks. So you and I will not be doing it on the weekends? Pro probably not. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Rob. And Peg, back to you.
All right, thanks, Rob and Barrett. Well, Cincinnati medical device startup Medicheck has raised more than $1 million to continue to develop its healthcare technology. Medicheck produces a tablet computer that serves one purpose, alerting seniors when it's time to take their medicine and notifying caretakers or physicians if they don't. The funding was led by the Queen City Angels and joined by individual investors. The additional funding will help to continue to grow the company, hire senior talent, and add additional employees in marketing and sales. The new president of Mercy Health Physicians Cincinnati grew up in a medical family. Dr. Randy Kernow says he was led to medicine in part because of insight he gained from his father, an endocrinologist. His move from practicing medicine to administrative leadership was less foreseeable, but he says important. I think the greatest opportunity and challenge is to navigate our physicians and all of our staff through this dynamic time of change in the healthcare system. Lots of new regulations, lots of new insurance opportunities, and lots of fundamental changes in the way we deliver. Kernow moved to Cincinnati in 2013 to join Mercy Health Physicians, the fourth largest medical group in the tri-state. A former University of Cincinnati football player has converted his investment advisory firm into one that focuses strictly on socially responsible impact investing. Chris Flores rebranded his Norwood-based independent advisory firm as Three Corners Capital. The corners signify the firm's aim to choose investments based on impact on people, planet, and profit. You know, I was raised in a very you know, charitable family. I saw that demonstrated growing up. Um, and through a number of different service projects and uh, service travel to Mexico, Russia, uh, and other places, I, you know, I realized that I wanted to find a, a way to interject my desire to make a difference with my skill set in finance. And so that is what, that's what prompted me to uh, create a, a company that was genuine in its approach to meet the, both of those. The firm advises on about $100 million in client assets. He started at zero in 2008 when he graduated from UC and got into the investment business. Responsible investing has always been a key part of his strategy, but now it's the entire focus. Cushman and Wakefield Cincinnati commercial realtors named a new president this week. Cy Pitstick is taking over the role at the downtown-based commercial real estate firm, the 10th largest commercial real estate firm in the region, according to Courier Research. Pitstick will be responsible for operations and setting future strategy. He says he expects the Cincinnati market to continue to see a lack of available inventory in 2015, along with the continued trend of increasing rental rates. Developers and city officials cut the ribbon last week on the new 7 at Broadway luxury apartment project. The project includes 111 luxury apartments on seven floors on top of an eight-floor parking garage. After just three weeks on the market, 50 percent of those units are leased. Uh, North American Properties has launched uh, many uh, new multifamily projects across the country in the last five years, uh, including in some of the hottest markets. Uh, Austin, Nashville, Dallas. Uh, early leasing results at 7 at Broadway beats them all. The $23 million project has studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom apartments with rents ranging from $1,200 to $3,700 per month. The units also have amazing city views. The founders of Funky's catering and branding and marketing firm Agar are teaming up to bring a large event center to a former Over the Rhine church. Josh Huser of Agar and Michael Forgus of Funky's Catering hope the $4.7 million renovation of the former Bethlehem Temple Apostolic Church will be complete by Labor Day. They're calling the new event center the Transept. The church is across the street from Washington Park and sits along the streetcar line. Huser says he's had an eye on that old church for a long time. I found the church in 2003 um, when I was still 22. Um, project was much bigger than I was able to do at the time. Um, saw it go back on for sale in 2011. Um, did a walk through the building, was really intrigued by the layout, the space, the location, and decided to do the transept. Forgus and Huser are bankrolling the project with $1.2 million in historic tax credits and other financing. They expect to create 26 jobs and have already events or scheduled events for the end of this year. And the East Walnut Hills is the site for Jean Robert's latest Cincinnati restaurant. Le Bar à Boeuf is now open and serving new French fare at the Edge Cliff at 2200 Victory Parkway. It's Jean Robert de, Robert de Cavell's third restaurant, and as the name suggests, it's all about the beef. So the main focus of the menu is 
It's a, it's a five different type of meat patties. And uh, so we offer a local bison, we offer a regular beef, a yago beef, lamb, and the fish patties. And then you can add whatever you would like to add on top of it. So it's kind of like the, the burger formula without the bread, and you eat, you eat with a knife and a fork. Entrees will range from 11 to $25. The restaurant features wines from all over the world, as well as classic cocktails and local, domestic, and imported beers. Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, what's happening to this old space in downtown Cincinnati that used to house a church of Scientology? And Terry's does it again, why it's worth the wait for a burger there. Sad news tops the stories that are getting a lot of attention on the Business Courier social media and website. Dr. Charles Kuntz of the Mayfield Clinic died unexpectedly at his Indian Hill home on Thursday. He was 50, one of the most highly regarded neurosurgeons in greater Cincinnati. He died in his sleep, reportedly from a seizure. The downtown Cincinnati building that was once the home of the Church of Scientology of Ohio is set to undergo a $6 million renovation into market-rate apartments. This building at 211 West 4th Street will be completely renovated into 39 apartments and two storefront retail spaces. Walnut Street Parking, Inc. purchased the building for $650,000. Cincinnati City Manager Harry Black said last week his gut instinct tells him there will be a shortfall to cover the cost of operating the streetcar. He stopped short of calling for Mayor John Cranley and City Con Council to overhaul the plan, but said the city's plan to pay for streetcar operations may not cover all of the expenses. Black cautioned he had not done a new analysis of the operating plan for Phase 1A, which runs in a loop from the banks to Finley Market. Kroger easily topped analyst expectations when the Cincinnati-based supermarket giant posted 28 percent fourth quarter, quarter profit growth late last week. The nation's largest operator of traditional supermarkets said it turned $1.04 per share in the quarter. That compares with its profits of $0.81 cents per share in the year-ago quarter. Analysts had been expecting Kroger to earn just $0.89 cents per share. Well, it may not look like much on the outside, but the burgers at Terry's Turf, Turf Club have been named the best in Ohio. The website Thrill List named the best burger in each of the 50 states. The Ohio selection is no surprise to those of us in the tri-state. The Linwood Burger Joint with its peanut shell littered floor and abundance of neon has also been featured on diners, drive-ins and dives and was named by Food Network magazine as Ohio's best. With all the recent concern about the ups and downs of the stock market, often overlooked is an important piece of the investment puzzle, dividends. Joining us for this morning's U.S. Bank Economic 360 is U.S. Bank Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager Mike Deniman. He's with business courier publisher Jamie Smith to talk about how dividends fit into your investment portfolio. Mike and Jamie. Thanks, Peg. Mike, thanks for being here today. Good morning. All right, let's start simply here. Okay. What is a dividend? Sure, good place to start. <laughs> uh, so you can think of a dividend as your share of the profits. So it's important to remember that if you hold stock, you are a part owner. That's why we call them equities, because they truly represent an ownership interest. And like in any business, the owners share in the profits. So uh, with a publicly traded company, uh, after the bills are paid, after money is set aside for expansion and research, what's left over, a portion of that is carved off and returned to the owners, the shareholders, as a dividend. So it happens usually on a quarterly basis. And as Peg said, this is an important piece of the puzzle. Growth from stocks, of course, is very good. But getting paid cash every quarter is pretty Even good, better. too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so dividends are a good thing. Okay. How do, how do the uh, investors, how should we use dividends when we're looking and evaluating these companies? Well, sure, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, dividends often signal to us when evaluating different stocks that this is a profitable company. Uh, dividends have long been the hallmark of blue chip stocks, strong, stable, very high quality companies. 
And so these, of course, are all very attractive attributes. Uh, and then even more important often is a growing dividend, one that's being increased sequentially over time. This tells us that this is a growing business. This is one that has the ability to continue to return bigger profits to its owners. Now, I, I say all of this with one big caveat, and that is that while dividends we think are very important and we like to see them from a stock, just because a company doesn't pay a dividend doesn't mean it's unhealthy. There are many types of companies, technology companies, for instance, which plow a lot of their profits back into their expansion and their research and development. So in the growing stages, there's not a lot left over for dividends. So important to remember if you're going to invest in a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, just to evaluate why that is. Oftentimes, there are very legitimate reasons. Other times, though, it, it can be a red flag. Is there a combination of other things that go along with that dividend when I'm, when I'm making that evaluation? I mean, how important is it, the dividend versus not the dividend? Exactly. If you're looking for a company that's brand new, that's in a growth phase, and you're looking for it to just explode, it's probably not going to pay you a dividend. It's more focused on that growth process. On the other hand, a more traditional uh, blue chip type company, a dividend is going to be a very big piece of that equation because the growth probably isn't as significant as a, a startup tech company. Mm -hmm. Looking at like current times now, is there any time that the dividend is more important than uh, not? I mean, given the environment? Yeah, so I just sat here and explained how great dividends were, but uh, I have to say that with a note of caution. Uh, reason being, we're all aware that interest rates have been at record lows in recent years. And so many investors who traditionally have counted on income from bond investments have been forced to look elsewhere since bonds are paying relatively little in interest. So many of those investors have gone to high dividend paying stocks to make up the shortfall. And supply and demand has pushed the shares of those price, the price of those shares higher. higher. So we sit here now waiting any day for the Fed to start moving interest rates higher. So as rates begin to climb again, that trend will reverse. Okay. Investors who were forced towards stocks will reevaluate and head back towards bonds. So okay. that could put some pressure on dividend-paying stocks. So uh, not looking to abandon dividends <laughs> completely, but just be aware that if you invest in the types of stocks with the highest dividends, that they could be seeing some sales pressure okay. in coming years. Well, now that it's tax time, I guess I should go Go That's look at mine and analyze through those, right? Good time to evaluate. And I know who to call if I have questions, right? Excellent. All right. Thanks for being here today. Peg, back to you. All right. Thanks, Jamie and Mike. Good information as always. Well, just ahead, the guy who covers real estate for the Business Courier is here to talk about why Cincinnati has become such a magnet for developers. And congratulations to Michael Browning, Assistant Vice President of Design, Construction, and Space Management at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, another of our 40 under 40 honorees. In this morning's Business Inside, for out-of-town developers, it appears Cincinnati is a land of opportunity. We reported on what is luring the developers in last week's show. That includes growing rental rates, declining vacancy, and historic buildings. In fact, as of two weeks ago, only five condos were available to buyers in Over the Rhine. Business Courier reporter Tom Demeropoulos covers real estate and wrote this story. He joins Business Courier editor Rob Daumeyer back in the studio. Gentlemen. Thank you very much, Peg. Tom, thanks for being here. So 3CDC really is the, is the group um, that controls most of the uh, residential stuff in Over the Rhine. Were they prepared for not, essentially, they're almost out of condos? Was this something that they sort of knew was going to happen? I think they saw this trend kind of coming, and they, they made some moves to tr try to, to jump on it as fast as they could, but they're still a little bit behind uh, the curve. So it, you know, 3CDC had been seeing sales of about 30, 35 condos a year uh, for the, the past couple of years. And then recently, those, those numbers really ramped up. It went to like 50 a year, 60 a year, 70 a year. And because of that, back in September, they announced four new projects that are, that are going to add about 36 new condos and townhomes. Uh, the problem is we won't start seeing those units delivered. There's a, a four-unit development that will be de delivered in the next couple of weeks. And then the other 30 or so aren't going to be delivered until starting August, September, and later in the fall. 
So, I mean, this is a lot uh, for anybody who knows over the Rhine. It's not the biggest area in the world. This is a lot of condos. Is this is this a bubble? I mean, does anybody feel like this is this is something that's going to wane this interest? You start hearing that word, but if you look at kind of all the demographic trends that uh, that people would look at, I, I don't think so. This is uh, what everyone is seeing across the nation. People want to live near the urban core. They want want a walkable neighborhood. They want to be able to go and get coffee and walk to work and go out to dinner all within, you know, a couple steps of their home. And it's the it's the two different groups that are interested. It's the young professionals, the millennials who uh, just aren't as interested in living in the suburbs as their parents were. And it's also the, the baby boomers who are empty nesters and you know, they want to be part of a community. They want to feel like they are, you know, part of Cincinnati, and Over the Rhine really is, offers that uh, that opportunity. Well, it's been ama an amazing transformation, again, for anybody who's uh, uh, spent any time in Over the Rhine. Um, uh, you know, I remember uh, when you just really didn't even want to drive through there, and, and now I couldn't even afford to live in a lot of the places. So thanks very much for being here. Thanks, Rob. And back to you. All right, thanks, Rob and Tom, and thank you for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. We'll be back next Sunday and every Sunday morning at 6.30 here on Local 12 and 10 a.m. on The CW. For more business news all week long, you can visit the Business Courier online and follow on Twitter and Facebook. The address is CincinnatiBusinessCourier.com. I'm Peg Rasconi. Have a great Sunday.